All for the good of the kingdom, right? Has God ever called you to do something crazy? And you said, oh my goodness, Lord. Are you serious? That's pretty much what I thought when he called me to pastor and preach. Oh my goodness, Lord, are you serious? You know, at 30 years later, I'm going, thank you for calling me to pastor and to preach. Because the past 30 years of my life have been a dream. Not a nightmare, but a dream. I tell people the best place you can ever live is not a street address somewhere. It's in the perfect will of God. And I hope and pray that as you journey together with God, you find His perfect will for your life. He's gifted you and graced you in ways. He's built you as a person and a personality that is unlike anything else on the face of the earth. Even though we have, what, like 8 billion people on the face of the earth now? There is no one else exactly like you. And God wants to express God's self through you in a very unique way. And if you don't allow that to happen and welcome that to happen, then that is a part of the body of Christ that's going to be missing. I had a wonderful time this morning sharing with our steps class, and I was talking about spiritual gifts and things like that. And I challenged the class. I said, God has given you spiritual gifts. And if you don't bring those to the table, if you don't use those in the local body of Christ, the body of Christ is the lesser for it. We need everyone doing what God has called and gifted them to do for us to be the fullness of who God has called us to be as Gunnersville First United Methodist Church. Part of our calling is to witness our faith in Jesus Christ is to let other people know about the good news of Jesus. The sermon title today as we think about witnesses, who will tell them? Who will tell your family about Jesus? Who will tell your co-workers about Jesus? Who will tell those in the community in which you live about Jesus? Who will tell them? Well, God has called and gifted us to tell them. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning as we look at Paul's words in his letter to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 17. We're going to hear some very powerful statements made by Paul in this passage. And it's things that we need to take to heart and mind this morning as we consider who we are as individuals and collectively as a church in the body of Christ. Hear the word of the Lord, Romans chapter 10. This is the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. But faith's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. Let me try that again. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. But faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart, who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth? And don't say, who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again? In fact, it says, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the Scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in Him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. 
They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on Him to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they have never heard about Him? And how can they hear about Him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the Scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. May God add His richest blessings to the reading of His Word. The world is a very religious place. As I think about people of the world, I'm just kind of reminded that we were created to be in relationship with God and because God has been revealed to us, as only God can reveal God's self, we are people who worship God. We are worshipers. We are created to be worshipers. And you know, the, the fall of humankind happened in Genesis chapter 3. And, 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 and men and women, humankind, went astray from God. And, and, and there in the early chapters of Genesis, I see that phrase. And, and, and men, humankind, men and women, begin to call on the name of the Lord. There was something inside of them that would not be quiet. There, there was a pursuit that they had to follow, a, an itch they had to scratch, some hunger they had to satisfy. They began to call upon the Lord. They began to worship God. They began to bring offerings before God, sometimes a proper offering, sometimes an improper offering. And, and God began to take note as, as humankind began to follow this innate desire to worship. But the problem with that is, because people don't always want to go in the direction of God, people begin to worship other things. All through the Old Testament you see about the worship of false gods and idols. And on many occasions, Israel got themselves in very, very much trouble with God because they chose to worship false gods instead of the one true living God who had revealed Himself in beautiful and powerful and wonderful ways. But people are religious to some degree, it seems like just by their own very nature. Paul identifies a religious zeal that the Jews had for God. But the problem was, it was a misdirected zeal. God had sent Jesus to fulfill the law. To live, to die, to rise again on the third day, that there may be forgiveness of sins for you and I, for the people of Jesus' day, and that they might come into relationship with God through faith in Christ. And, and Jesus first and foremost came to the Jews, the Israelites. But you know what? Their idea, their image of a Savior was much different than what Jesus presented Himself to be. They wanted to see this mighty king like David or Solomon or something of that nature to come in and, and show the Roman Empire who's boss. I'm going to put you back in your place. And Jesus, the Savior of the world, was going to reign over the world. Kind of in this idea of... of a King David or a King Solomon. And because he didn't do that, I mean, they even tried to drag him off one day to make him king. And it, no, nope, that's not why I came. You, you've missed the point of what God is doing in and through me. And because they rejected him as Savior, they lost out. But they didn't stop their religious practices. And they did whatever they felt like they could do to fulfill the law. And in doing those things, things they felt like they were right with God. But what they failed to understand and embrace was that God's plan had changed in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it wasn't just the Israelites that Paul encountered. It wasn't just the Jews. 
In Acts chapter 17, we read where Paul is in Athens and he's out in the marketplace and he begins to share Jesus with people out there and some of the learned people and the philosophers and and those who like to sit around and talk about high and lofty things heard Paul speaking about Jesus and they called him aside and began to inquire this about this new teaching that Paul was presenting. And he told them about Jesus. And he said, let me tell you, this is who Jesus is. He said, I, I, I went through the city and I saw all of these statues. And he said, I, I saw a statue to the unknown God. I'm here to tell you about the God you don't know. I thought that was so powerful. Because truly, they did not know Jesus. And they did not know God through faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I've come to tell you about This guy you don't know, and his name is Jesus. And he lived, and he died, and he rose again for your salvation. Let me share him with you. And they listened, and then they wanted you to come back and talk to him a little bit more a little bit later on. So people across the spectrum of humankind were were very religious and had religious practice in Paul's day, in Old Testament times. And you know what? It hasn't changed any today. We look around and say, oh, how different the world is. You ever stop and look around and go, oh, how similar and same the world is. 84% of the population of the world is affiliated to a religious group. Number one on the list is Christianity. And when you go down the list, you hear Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Judaism. Those are the top five. Now, there's one group, it's a mixed bunch of a variety of religious groups that make up another percentage to get the whole 84%. But 84% of humankind on the face of the earth today has some religious preference and practice. But we know today what Paul knew back then, that religion will not catch you anywhere with God because just simple religious practice can lead you away from God. That's what was taking place with the Jews in Paul's day. When they rejected Jesus and chose to continue to pursue the law to make themselves right with God, they did not please God. They did not make themselves right with God. Relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ is what God desires. That's exactly what God wants for our hearts and our lives. But even today... We try to come up with ways to at least help us think within ourselves that we're okay with God. And you may have talked to somebody about coming to church or faith in Jesus Christ, and they said something like this, well, you know, I'm a good person. Why why do I need to go to church? I'm a good person. Why do I need Jesus in my heart and life? I'm a good person. Or some will say, it's almost like they have a balance, a scales. They'll say, well, I, I, I really feel like the amount of good I do in the world today outweighs the bad. And I believe God, being an all-knowing, all-seeing God, knows that the good I do in my life outweighs the bad. And as a Christian, and someone who understands the teaching of Scripture, I go, no, you haven't got it right yet. Works is not what makes us Right with God. And then some people will say, look, I I give to the church. I I give financially to other uh, charitable organizations. God sees how I give. God sees how good I am. All the while, what are we doing? We're trying to make our own pathway to right standing with God instead of following the path that God has given us in Christ Jesus. This is how Paul states it. Refusing to accept God's way They cling to their own way of getting right with God. See, there's only one way to get right with God. That's through faith in Jesus Christ. But the Jews were trying to do it by keeping the law. And Paul rightly says, all who believe in Him are made right with God. It's by faith and faith alone. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8, By grace you are saved through faith. Not of works, lest anyone would boast. It is the gift of God. 
So it doesn't matter what our works are, good, bad, anywhere in between. It doesn't matter how much good we do versus bad. It doesn't matter how much we give to whatever organization. All who believe in Him are made right with God. And then Paul takes that powerful truth and unpacks it a little bit more in verse number 9 and verse number 10. He says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. So, an open declaration, believe in our heart. Then verse number 10. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. It is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Believe in our heart. Believe in our heart, not in our head. Our heart. Sometimes our head and our heart are in disagreement with each other. My heart says this thing, my head says something else. My heart says, you need to forgive that person who hurts you. But your head says, you better not. They'll do it again. What are you? Just a doormat to be wiped upon and stepped upon? No. If you believe in your heart, the very core of your being, your spirit, your soul, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, You are going to be saved. It is easy to understand that what is powerful and important in our hearts will be declared with our mouths because Jesus said, out of the abundance of our hearts, our mouths speak. You know, I can spend five minutes with you and I know what your life's all about. Because if you immediately begin to talk about the nice weather outside and man, this is a beautiful day to be on the lake fishing. I know where your heart's at. Or if you talk about, man, I, I can't wait till next weekend because we're going to get to go on vacation. I'm going to get to spend time with my family. My work keeps me away from my family. I, I can't wait to be down there on the beach, in the sand, in the water, playing with my kids, my grandkids. Just in a few moments, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or you could be out there going, I wish he would shut up and be quiet. I'm hungry. I'm tired of being here. This pew is hard. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You said, I'd never say that, but that doesn't mean it's not in your heart. But have you ever noticed the things that are important, the powerful things in our hearts and our lives come out of our mouths? And it's very important, just as Paul says, just as Jesus says, that we profess our faith with our mouth. Well, number one, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But I want to share with you just quickly three other reasons why it's powerfully, it's vitally important that we don't just stop with believing in our hearts, but that we also openly declare our faith with our words and our mouths. Number one, our profession of our faith strengthens our Faith. Our profession of our faith strengthens our faith. What does that mean? Have you ever been in a difficult place in life? You had a big challenge before you, and you took that well known promise of Paul to the church at Philippi I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You might have said it quietly inside because you knew it was a promise of God and you believed it was a promise of God for you. And you looked at the challenge, the mountain before you, and you said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you begin to say it out loud. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you find that brother in Christ and you say it together. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you say that with me? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you get strength from that. You want to know why? Because your voice is the one you listen to the most. Your voice will convince you of who you are and where you are above and beyond any other voice on the face of the earth. I can tell you how smart you are. And you can tell you how dumb you think you are. Who will you believe? You'll believe your own voice. So when we speak the promises of God, even about our salvation, we strengthen our own faith. And in the world in which we live today, our faith needs to be strong. So declare your salvation and your belief in Christ openly before yourself, before God, before others. Number two, Matthew 10, 32. 
Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. If you are ashamed, if you are embarrassed to let somebody else know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus will be ashamed and embarrassed about you as you stand before the Father in heaven. I want to tell you what. I see my grandkids. I, that's my grandson. That's my granddaughter. That's my son. That's my daughter. That's my child. Don't you know today that when Jesus looks down on the face of the earth and He sees you as a child of God, He says, that's my daughter. That's my son. That's my child. He's not ashamed. He's not embarrassed of you. Why in the world would be we be ashamed or embarrassed of Him? He says it very plainly. It's a vital part of our faith and living out our faith every day. If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. That lets me know that it's very important that my faith in Christ is shared with the words of my mouth for others to hear and see, because I know when I tell you, there's another pair of ears listening, and it's God's ears listening to whatever I have to say. And number three, and Paul brings this out in his letter, how can they call on Him to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they have never heard about Him? And how can they hear Him unless someone tells them? How can they hear about Him unless someone tells them? It is our responsibility to share the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with those ears that need to hear that good news. Paul said there in verse number 1, The longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. What's the longing of your heart this morning? What's your prayer to God? Is it about your grandson, your granddaughter, your children, your neighbor, your co-worker, your friend? Maybe even somebody you don't know. It's your longing that they come to faith in Jesus Christ. And if you're going to pray for their salvation, why not just put the icing on the cake and be one of those people that tell them about Jesus too? Or tell them about Jesus and ask that over with prayer. I hope the longing of your heart mirrors the heart of Paul, the heart of Jesus, the heart of our Father. And that is that that next person comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And you or I may be the one to tell them. What a privilege it is if we are. Amen? Amen. We're going to have a, a hymn of invitation, our final hymn for the day. The altar's open for any response that you may have to God this morning. If you have not already uh, brought your commitment card down, your commitment of giving for the gear, uh, and placed it in the basket, we invite you to come. Uh, you can come and put it in the basket and pray. You can pray and put it in the basket. Uh, this is about stewardship, holistic stewardship, the stewardship of our entire lives and you may want to come and pray about that this morning the altars are open if i can pray with you about anything please let me know i would love to pray with you stand as we sing